So turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 12. Um, we continue our study, sculpted by the potter's hand, looking at the life of Peter. And how Peter began as nothing more than a clump of mud. Just a clump of mud, uh, clay, and Jesus took him and began to mold him and make him and fashion him into the form of a man, a godly man that Jesus wanted him to be. In Acts chapter 12, it is the darkest of times. We've been reading through, I mean, if we had been reading through, we been, this has not been a series on Acts, it's been a series on Peter. So we spent most of our time in the Gospels. But if you read through the book of Acts, you see great and wonderful things that took place, beginning with the day of Pentecost and the great conversion of 3,000 souls. Um, and, and the church grows and builds and great things are happening until we come to the seventh chapter and Stephen is put to death. But then we move on and more good things are happening. But by the time we come to Acts chapter 12, which by the way is about 14 years after the ascension, when you read through the book of Acts, time seems to pass quickly and you don't realize how much time has gone by. But in chapter 12, things get very dark. Even in the darkest of times, folks, God wants our focus to be on him. God never promised that every day would be a sunny day, that every day would be a parting of the clouds. And sometimes there are dark days and often it's in those dark days when we least expect to see God's loving hand upon us. And we're kind of mumbling around, um, hanging our head, struggling, sorrowing, um, battling over the darkness of the times for us. And it's in those times so very often that God most reveals his presence and reminds us of his sovereignty and reminds us that he is with us. Now this is the 13th message in this series, okay? And the, 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 the book of Acts has has um, um, Peter, in the book of Acts, has become a great, great man, a wonderful man, a powerful man, a man of God. Um, we, we covered a lot of ground here in looking at the life of Peter. It was a long journey. It was a long road for the apostle. We saw his impulsiveness. And his impulsiveness sometimes was embarrassing, often was embarrassing to him and to the other disciples. We saw his failures and his denial of even knowing Jesus at the crucifixion. But we can't deny that this man is a man that loved Jesus intensely and earnestly and was committed to the cause of Christ. You see, the Lord used Peter to open the gospel. The Lord used Peter to take the gospel where the gospel had never gone before. In fact, Peter became the, the doorway, as it were, the first one to walk through the doorway to three different groups. Number one, to the Jews. In Acts chapter 2, it's Pentecost. Peter is the one that stands up and preaches to the people and thousands are saved that day. And then the second thing that we see is Peter is the first one to go to the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. He goes to them and is even criticized for doing it until he tells the other apostles exactly what happened. And they realize that the power of God has reached out. Um, the redemptive plan of God has extended even to the Samaritans. And then Peter is the first one to go to the Gentiles. And again... There are those that don't like that. But Peter explains to them what happened, what he saw, what God did. And it was a mighty, mighty thing. What a great person Peter has begun. Now, let me just say this. I'm going to go back up to this is the 13th message. Next week, I'm going to finish with the Apostle Peter. and We're going to look at his legacy. And people always ask me, well, where are we going next? Well, I have... Two exciting things, okay? First of all, let's remember that the Advent season and the holiday season is soon upon us. And so between Thanksgiving and Christmas, we will finish out the year. And then, I'm really excited about this, write it down, put it in your phone, have Siri remind you, okay? Starting in January, I'm going to do a 10-part series on the end times and the second coming of Jesus Christ. What about the rapture? What about the Antichrist? What about the tribulation? Um, what about the nation of Israel? What about um, 
the, um, the wrath of God, and we're going to look at the millennium and heaven and uh, over a 10-week period. Now, some of you sat through my college class, mostly for audit, a few of you for credit, and, and, um, and this is not the same as that, okay? That's a class, and I didn't have any restrictions on time, and so I was able to go into extensive detail. Um, this will be preaching, not that teaching exactly like that, but I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be a great, great time. So the first 10 weeks in the new year, we will dedicate to a sermon series called He is Coming Again. Okay, so, so uh, join me for that. Well, all of a sudden, everything changed in the book of Acts. All of a sudden, oh, I got to say one more thing about the Advent series coming up. I have my Advent guides all put together. These are your devotions if you'll use them from December 1st through Christmas Day, okay? And I'm going to be talking about um, this during my sermons in the Advent series. And, and there, you'll notice this year that they're very brief. Uh, it'll take you a minute or two or three to read the devotion for the day. And the, the, um, the purpose of it is not for me to do all of your work, but for you to read through it and ponder... Um, Brett Davenport, you introduced me to the word, well, I knew the word before, but you like the word ruminate. Ruminate, okay? Ruminate means chew your cud. Chew on it. Think about it. I like the word saunter. Saunter, okay? Which means holy land. Saunt, holy. Ter, ter, land. Um, and when you come into the scripture, you come into the holy land and spend some time enjoying uh, the journey as you saunter in the word of God. Suddenly everything came to a screeching halt with a death uh, and a rest. And certainly a second pending death, so it appeared from the outside. However, the one who probably was going to be put to death, who had been thrown into prison is so at peace that he falls asleep and an angel has to come along and smack him in the cheek and say, wake up, get out of this place. Stand together with me. I'm going to read a long passage of scripture this morning. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 to 24. About this time, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the Passover season. And after arresting him, he put him in prison, handed him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Sixteen soldiers round the clock are guarding Peter. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He, the angel, struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Get up, quick! And the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and your sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. The angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them all by itself. And they went through it. And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left. And Peter came to himself and said, now I know without doubt, a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, the doorway that led to the courtyard before you got to the actual house, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening the door and exclaimed to those that were praying inside, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, girl, they told her. When she kept insisting it was so, they said, well, it must be his ghost, his angel, his spirit. When Peter kept knocking and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. 
Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said, and then he left for another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and didn't find him, he cross-examined the guards and he ordered them to be executed. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea over by the ocean and stayed there a while. And he had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him, having secured the support of Blastos, his trusted, a pers trusted personal servant of the king. They asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod was wearing his war royal robes, sat on his throne, and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of God, not man. And immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to increase and to spread. Heavenly Father, as we come now into your word, as we saunter, as we walk into the holy land, Lord, I know that among us there are some here today that are struggling with prisons in their own life. Prisons that have them bound. Prisons that are stealing their victory, robbing their joy. I pray, Lord, that we might see you anew afresh today as a God of the impossible, a God who opens prison doors. Bless our time, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. As we look at this passage of scripture, I want you to understand that there are providential links in this passage. Three links in a providential chain. Sometimes we need to be reminded that God is in charge. God is God. God's in control. God is acting. And God isn't only doing things in our lives that we would call good according to our definition. Sometimes God is using difficult circumstances. He's allowing difficult circumstances for our good and for his praise. Let's remember Job in the Old Testament. How God allowed tough things to happen to Job for Job's good and for God's glory. We see it in Moses. We see it in Joseph. Goodness, Joseph was thrown into prison as was Peter. We see it all through the Old Testament. We see it through the New Testament. We see it through the history of the church and in our own lives. God is at work, folks. God is at work. And God is at work within us. So I want you to see three links in the providential chain. And link number one is Peter was arrested. Peter was not arrested outside of the will of God. Peter was not arrested outside of the knowledge of God. God didn't look down to Peter as he's being um, handcuffed and hauled away and put into prison and say, Wow, I didn't, I didn't expect that to happen? No, no. This is a link in the providential chain. God is doing a work. God is doing a great thing. And so we have Herod, who is Herod Agrippa I. Now in the New Testament time, there are six Herods that span the, our period from the birth of Jesus through the book of Acts. This is the grandson of Herod the Great. Herod the Great is the notorious Herod of Jesus' birth that had the baby boys put to death. This is his grandson. It's a cruel family. There is not a good one in the entire bunch of them, okay? And, and they're evil, and I believe that they are demon-possessed men, certainly Satan-influenced and guided men. So Herod um, gets involved in the events in Jerusalem 14 years after the ascension of Jesus, and he has James, the brother of John, the sons of Zebedee, he has James arrested and put to death by the sword, which means he was decapitated. And Herod saw that that pleased the Jews. Now it pleased the unbelieving Jews, those that detested the early church and the Christians and made life so hard for the early church in Jerusalem. In fact, it was the Jews who were the chief persecutors of the believers in Jesus in those first years in Jerusalem. 
Herod saw that it pleased the Jews, and so he had Peter arrested as well. And his intent was that he would put Peter to death also. Um, had him arrested, but he had him arrested right before Passover season. So he decided to leave Peter in prison through the Passover, through the holiday season. When it was over and behind, he would then have Peter put to death. Now I want you to understand, Peter didn't do anything wrong. He wasn't arrested rightly because he had committed some crime. It was unfair. It was unjust for him. Unfair and unjust things happen to us in life. People say things that aren't so. People accuse us of things that we didn't do. People make assumptions that are not true. Sometimes life just isn't fair. Why? Because we're living in a fallen world. This is a broken world. And things go wrong and sometimes things go bad. Now Peter's in prison. Folks, there's no justice. There's no legal avenue for him to pursue and there is no political help available to him. He can't write his local congressman. He, he can't... Um, um, file charges and take it to the Supreme Court or appeal his case all the way up to the Supreme Court. There's no justice. What's going to happen to him is going to happen to him by Herod's own word and it's not fair. Sixteen soldiers, the Bible tells us, are guarding him. Probably uh, four in a group and four groups in a 24-hour period of time. The Bible says two are chained to him. So one is chained to his right arm and one to his left arm. And then there's one at the entrance to his chamber and there's one at the gate to the prison, or at least to his part of the prison, that are guarding him. So here's what I want you to understand. Peter's in a dilemma. Peter's in a rough situation. Peter's arrested. Peter is not outside the providential plan of God, but from the human perspective, from man's perspective, from my perspective, Peter didn't have a chance. His boat was sunk. And escape was impossible. Now here's where if I could preach standing up, I'd be dancing around the platform back and forth, okay? Because God loves the impossible. Oh boy. God loves the impossible. God ordained that Peter would be arrested unfairly, unjustly. God ordained that Peter would find himself in a position from human perspective that was impossible. God loves the impossible. Link number two in the providential chain. Peter's rescued. Verses 12, 5 to 15 tell us about Peter's rescue. It's quite an interesting story. There's lots of humor in Acts chapter 12. I think it's funny that Peter has fallen asleep and he is so sleeping that when the whole chamber fills with a bright light, the Lord has to smack him on the cheek and say, Peter, wake up, wake up. I also find it interesting that later on, the angel of the Lord, just like the angel smacked Peter, I kind of think it was the same angel, but I can't prove it, smacked Herod and struck him dead. Same word, by the way, is used in both instances. When you're on God's team and the angel of the Lord strikes you on the cheek, it's for good reasons. When you're anti-God, anti-Christ, and the angel of the Lord strikes you, it's trouble for you. Peter's rescued. Three things that I see. Number one, I see a praying church. I see a praying church. They prayed earnestly and earnestly in the Greek is really a word that means they're praying around the clock, folks. They are praying diligently, earnestly, unstoppingly, Randy, hard. Whatever that means, they're praying. You've heard me say, I don't know what praying hard means, okay? Um, but they're praying diligently, continuously. They're praying for Peter. Now, I got to just pause here, man. This isn't in my sermon. It might make me go over. But sometimes we don't really believe in answered prayer as a church. You know that? I, at the men's retreat I was recently at, I told them a story I read where a church had a, um, a liquor store that was uh, going up next door to the church. It was a, a vacant lot like we have over here. And a guy bought it and put up a liquor store. And the church went over and they asked him not to build next to the church. And he said, no, I bought this land. This is what I'm doing. And they said, well, then we're going to pray that, that your business will fail. 
and it'll be destroyed. Well, he built the liquor store and he had the grand opening and then one day there was a tremendous, tremendous storm, lightning storm. Lightning struck the, the, um, the, the saloon, the bar, the pub, and it burned down to the ground. He sued the church. <laughs> they went to court. The judge said, I'm going to tell you right now, before it even began, he said at the beginning, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but here's what I do know. The owner of the bar believes in answered prayer, and the people of the church don't. Because they're saying, no, we didn't do that, we didn't do that. Here's the church praying. And when Peter comes knocking at the door, they're saying, no, it can't be. Because that would mean answered prayer. Folks, if you're going to believe... If you're going to pray, then you've got to recognize that God's at work and God's answering prayer. Second thing I see here is the power of God at work. Power of God's all over in this chapter. Number one, power over people. He causes the guards to fall asleep so that they can't wake up. No man can prevent the purpose of God, folks. No politician, no king, no emperor, no court no enemy, no foe, no conqueror, no antagonist, no one, no man can prevent the purpose of God. Secondly, I see power over matter. The chains fell off. The gates fell down. In the Greek, it actually gives me the idea that the chains disintegrated. They didn't just unlock. They fell into pieces. They broke all apart. Maybe they turned to dust. No physical power, no substance is greater than God. No steel has been made. There is no iron. There is no metal invented by man or ever will be that can bind what God is loosening. And number three, the prayer of the church, the power of God, and the perplexity of the believers. There they are, praying. Don't interrupt us, Rhoda, we're praying. But Peter's at the door. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Oh, no. He must be dead, and it's his spirit. No, he's there. He's there. The perplexity of the believers. There's a third link in the providential chain. And it's Peter's vindicated. I want you to know that the church of Jesus Christ has suffered through the ages. 2,000 years has gone by. This very day you've heard me say this. If you follow martyrs in the world, about 100,000 Christians every year die for their faith. In this very day and age, 100,000 Christians every year put to death because of their faith. Through the ages, there's been horrible, horrible times of massacre of believers. Unfairly, and sometimes by the church itself. During the Reformation, it was the church that didn't like the Anabaptists that came along and said, we're going to baptize believers, adults. And the church... The real church, the Reformed church, laid hold of Anabaptists and drowned them to death, calling it the third baptism. They were infant baptized, they were adult baptized, and now we're going to baptize you to death. The church persecuted the church. But I want you to know that in the end, no matter how unfair life is, no matter how cruel this world is, in the end, believers will be vindicated and we will receive life everlasting that will not end, no, not ever. Here, Peter is actually vindicated in his lifetime. And he's vindicated in the last part of our scripture reading where Herod dies and Peter lives. You see, there's a Colosseum in Caesarea. This is not Caesarea Philippi. Um, this, is, uh, this is Caesarea over by the coast. And it was a city that was built by Herod's grandfather. There's a great Colosseum in Caesarea, and that's an actual picture of it today. It's still there. And Herod went out into the Colosseum, and the city gathered to hear 
him speak that day. And Herod went out in all his glory, in all his pomp, in all his glitz and glamour. Josephus, who is a first century historian and was alive at this time. So we're reading someone who maybe wasn't there, but it happened in his lifetime. Josephus records that Herod had a royal robe made out of silver that he would, fa he would fa fashion himself so that when he was in public with that on, the sun would be shining down on him and it would glow. It was like a mirror. It would glow and glisten. Sending off light rays in every direction as the silver kind of moved and wrinkled in the wind and the breeze and the day. And so there he was, sitting out in front of all the people, aglow in front of them. And the people were overwhelmed with Herod and they said, this is a God. This is not a man, this is a God. And Herod's sitting there saying, yep, yep I am. Thanks for recognizing well, the Bible tells us God struck him down and he was eaten by worms. Now, I don't have time to go into the history of that, but it's an amazing history of what actually happened to him and it actually happened to him. Eaten by worms. God said, let me show you your God. Your God's going to get eaten from the inside out by worms. No. No. Our God is the providential, powerful God. So that's the third link. Now, what I have to ask is, what are the lessons that we learn from this? Why is this in the Bible? I mean, it's a cool story, right? So Luke is sitting down one day and he's recording the Acts of the Holy Spirit, writing the book of Acts to Theophilus, his friend. And Luke, um, by his own word, is researching these things and interviewing eyewitnesses for everything Luke has written in the book of Luke and the book of Acts. Take my New Testament history class. You'll see that he interviewed these people, every one of them, before he wrote these things down. So did Luke say, well, this is a cool story. I think I'll put a cool story in my book. No. Was it written down so that Luke could help Peter remember that when Peter had grandchildren and they were sitting on his knee, Peter could say, let me tell you about the time I was in prison. No, I don't think so. Why is this recorded in our Bibles? I believe that it's recorded in our Bibles so that Peter, and by extension, us, will grow in our faith and our understanding of the mighty hand of our God. The mighty providential hand of our God. The authority and power of our God. That it's real, folks. It's real. It's real in our own lives. It's real today. It's real tomorrow. It's real the next day. God is real and God is at work and God is in charge and in control. I believe that Peter learned at least three lessons um, from this experience. Let me give them to you. Maybe this afternoon as you're pondering, ruminating on this passage of scripture, you can come up with some more. But let me, for the sake of time, give you three, okay? Number one, Peter learned again that God is sovereign. I don't see any lessons in the Bible that I only need to learn once. How about you? By the way, I think that's why Jesus instituted the ordinance of communion to the New Testament church. And reminded us that as often as we do this, we do this in remembrance, lest we forget. It's why we celebrate Christmas every year. That remember, we remember the glorious love of God, who so loved the world that he gave his son. God is sovereign. Now, I'm going to take you back 45 years. Because I got I got to tell you that uh, Dr. Stanton Richardson was my theology instructor in Bible college a long, long time ago, and and I remember him writing the word sovereign up on the blackboard, and guess what color the blackboard was? It was black, and he used chalk, <laughs> and he wrote sovereign up, and then he circled. Whoops, my circle moved. 
Reign. He circled reign so that sovereign always understands sovereign means the reign of God. It means to reign over, to act with supreme power and absolute authority. God reigns. Struggling with an issue in your life, God reigns. Struggling with a medical matter in your life, God reigns. Struggling with a relationship, turmoil in your life, God reigns. Struggling with a financial issue, God reigns. Struggling with depression, God reigns. Sadness, anger, fear, fill in the blank, God reigns. God is sovereign. God is all-powerful. God is able. God is able. God is able. God was sovereign at the beginning of Acts 12 in James's death. Satan didn't win that battle. God won that battle, folks. Well, why did God allow James to die and Peter to live? Let me tell you. I don't know. I don't know. But God reigns. God never promised us that it was always going to work out according to our way of things working out. God reigns. God's purpose was that James would die for his glory and that Peter would live for his glory. God has ordained that whatever is going on in your life would, go, would exist for his glory. So why was Peter sleeping that night? As soon as Passover was over, he was a dead man. I don't know if I'd be sleeping. I might be awake worrying. How could Peter be so restful, so peaceful in all of this? Well, I think it's because he believed the word of Jesus. I believe it. He believed the word, folks. See, the fact is, Jesus spoke to Peter in John chapter 21. We looked at this a few weeks ago. And said to him, Peter, when you are old... You remember that Peter wanted to know what kind of death John was going to die? Jesus said, mind your own business, Peter. When you are old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will bind you and lead you where you do not want to go. Stretching out your hands was a euphemism. An idiom for being crucified. You're going to be crucified. And it says in your Bible, someone else will clothe you or dress you. But it means bind you. And you'll be led where you don't want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Herod, under the Roman government, had no right to crucify Now, if you can't be crucified, you can't die yet. And so I think Peter fell asleep because he believed the word of Jesus. He believed the word of Jesus. This isn't my time. God is sovereign, folks. God is sovereign. He believed all the promises. He believed all the promises concerning this life and the next life. Eternally, eternity. Believe the word. God is sovereign. God reigns. God is in control. God is in charge for every event in your life today and forever and ever and ever. Amen. Maybe you think that Peter was fortunate in that Jesus spoke to him audibly with specifics about his death. And wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if Jesus would just speak to me and say, here's the plan I have for you, Russell. Now I'm going to tell you right now, I don't want to know when I, I'm going to die. First, for two reasons. Number one, I'm not going to. But number two, I don't even want to focus on the, the date of my end in this present world because I want to focus on the Lordship of my Savior. And if I knew the date, I think I'd get distracted. But, 
I also think Jesus has spoken to me. Jesus gave me this promise. Peace I leave with you, Russell. My peace. Jesus said, my peace. I'm giving you my peace. Not the kind of peace the world has to give. Not the absence of conflict. But rest and trust in the conflicts of life, folks. The peace of Jesus. May the peace of Jesus be upon you. May the peace of Jesus be a reality in your heart and life. And when you feel like it's missing, cry out to Jesus and say, Jesus, give me peace. Let me see your peace. Let me feel your peace. Bathe me in your peace. Let me rest in you. And Jesus concluded, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. Why? The peace of Jesus is in me. His peace is in me. There's a second great lesson from the text. God's always victorious, folks. Always. Not sometimes. Not when things work out our way. God is victorious. Satan does not win. Satan doesn't overcome. Now, Herod never wins. The king, the president, the congress, men of this earth never win. Triumph always belongs to God. Victory is ours. Victory belongs to God's people. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. But look, look at this. Look at the facts. Peter was eventually crucified. Upside down. In Rome. Paul was decapitated. Nero had other Christians put to death. Burn them as torches in the night. Isn't that the devil winning? Well, I have to take you back to John 21 when Jesus told Peter how he would die. Notice verse 20, chapter 21 says, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Your death glorifies God, folks. That's why for a Christian, when we have a funeral or a memorial service, it's a time of thanksgiving and praise and recognition of the wonder that God has done in that person's life and is continuing to do. We'll see legacy next week. Your legacy in Christ lives long after your physical body on this earth. Our deaths bring glory to God. Jesus prayed, I long to be with them. I long for them to be with me. In your presence, he prayed to the Father. Peter's death glorified God. Paul's death glorified God. James's death glorified God. The death of the martyrs through the ages has glorified God. By the way, the word martyr... I mean, the, the, the word witness is the word martyr. That's where we... The word martyr means witness. These men and women through the ages died as witnesses to the cause of Christ. And God was glorified. Our present earthly sufferings are minor compared to the glory that awaits us. God is all-powerful. There's no situation in your life that's too big for God. There's no chain greater than our God. And there's no king mightier than our God. I have hundreds of friends on Facebook. From all sides of all kinds of spectrums. And somehow, some Christians seem to think that a government or a politic or a philosophy is king, is in control. No, God's in control, folks. God's in control. Don't ever forget, 
the New Testament gives us two clear instructions concerning Christians' relationship to their government. Number one, honor. Respect. Number two, pray. Peter wrote one, Paul wrote the other. Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Pay your taxes. Honor the government. Follow the laws. Now, when Peter and Paul wrote to honor and pray, who was president? Nero. You don't get worse than Nero. God is sovereign. God's in control. Not Nero. And not any other man or woman. Never forget, God doesn't lose control at, after an election. No. God's in charge. There's no king mightier than God. As a boy, I used to sing a song and it stayed with me all these years. I think I've shared it before. I don't know if any of you sang, sung it or not. Dan, you probably did. Got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Got any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible, for he can do what no other power can do. Have you seen that song? A couple of you know it, yeah. Wow. In a prison today? Don't ask me to do special music. You in a prison today? Got a river that looks uncrossable? Got a mountain you can't tunnel through? God loves the impossible. Back during the great awakening in the United States, primarily in Britain, God raised up four powerful men. Jonathan Edwards, George um, Whitfield, I was going to say Schofield, Whitfield, and John and Charles Wesley. Charles Wesley was a man of music. And I'm going to leave you with this. He wrote two, well, many, many. But I'm going to share two powerful hymns that he wrote. 300 years ago, Charles Wesley wrote, And Can It Be? Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. God's eye diffused a life get light giving ray. I woke. The dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? If you're living in a prison today, if you're struggling in a prison, some prisons are of our own making, some of them are unfairly thrust upon us, some of them are prisons of the past, regret, Memories. Our God is a God who gives life to the dead. Who breaks down the barriers and boundaries and, bound, and, and, and binding chains of prison. And he sets his people free. The second song. We're going to sing it in closing. Oh, four thousand tongues. Now I got to tell you, Charles Wesley liked to write songs. We're not going to sing the whole song because when he wrote Oh, Four Thousand Tongues, he wrote 19 verses. 19. And can it be, I put up verse 4. Oh, Four Thousand Tongues, this is also verse 4 of 19. I love this verse. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood 
availed for me. I want you to see something in that verse. Here's what I want you to understand. If you are in Christ Jesus today, your sin is canceled. Canceled. And yet, sometimes we live in the prison of our canceled sin. It's called memories. Shame. Regret. It's canceled, folks. You if, you, if you're living with a struggle over canceled sin, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, your past is forgiven. And if you're living with the shame, in the prison of shame of canceled sin, you're not understanding all your sin is paid and gone and removed and covered by the blood. So how do we find deliverance in our prisons? Number one, just be honest with God, folks. If you're struggling in a prison, whatever it is today, you just cry out to Jesus. Cry, Lord Jesus, I'm bound. Deliver me from this prison. Sometimes I find it hard to be honest with God, like he doesn't know already. And being honest with God, really, is being honest with yourself. It's admitting you have a need. It's beginning. It's admitting you, you're in a prison. It's admitting you're struggling. Number two, find a prayer partner. Be honest with them. Tell somebody your struggle. Don't bear it alone. Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia. And he said, bear one another's sins. Bear one another's burdens. There's times I have to go to the elders. Or I'll go to Randy. Or I'll go to someone else. Now, Randy is an elder, but I don't go to all of them. I'll just go to him. Or I'll go to someone else and I'll say, I need you to pray for me. This is my struggle. Find somebody to come alongside, to support you, to help you. Number three, bathe yourselves in the promises of God. Believe it, folks. Believe it. Like Peter in prison, his time had not come, and he knew his time had not come. And like us, struggling with issues in life, peace can be found because Jesus said peace can be found. Rest, comfort in the Lord. And number four, sometimes we need Christ-centered professional help. Yep, we do. Sometimes we need to go to somebody else. A believer, a Christian, a Bible-centered advisor and find help. Let me leave you with this. Just always believe. Always trust. Always hope. God is sovereign. God is victorious. And God is all-powerful.